So my name is Matthew Jaber Stifler. I'm the research and content manager here at the Arab American National Museum. And I've been here for about 12 years, and, and my role is overseeing a lot of the content we produce about the Arab American community, making sure that it's accurate and, re and reflects the, the, the breadth and depth of experiences of our broad Arab American community. Uh, in that role, I also oversee the collections of the library, which we're in right now, and of our other collections, our archival collections and photo photograph collections. I'll talk a little bit more about those. And so the goal of this, this is actually a project that's funded by uh, the National Archives through their NHPRC program. And uh, they gave us some money. We're working with some other organizations to uh, do some what we call community-based family history presentations, family history preservation workshops. Uh, we're also going to, there's some cameras happening around because we're going to turn it into an online training too to, to try to reach more people as well. So first thing is we'd like to talk about um, the museum's own collections. What is it that we have and what do we do with that stuff? So we have, um, in addition to the library collections you see around us, we have the most comprehensive collection of materials about the Arab American community anywhere in the country. So uh, in the lower level, actually right underneath this room is our uh, climate controlled, you know, secure storage where we keep uh, thousands of artifacts and photographs and documents from the wide range of experiences on our community. We use those to create exhibitions, uh, like the permanent exhibitions we have on our second floor space, to create smaller temporary exhibitions, like the small exhibition of comic book materials that we have in the case here in the library. And we use them for our traveling exhibitions. We have a bunch of pieces going out to a museum in New York City in the spring to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the publication of Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, a very famous book. And we have a lot of materials about Khalil Gibran and the Prophet. So we're going to send some of our materials to New York City to be on display for the centennial. So we use our materials a lot with educational programs. And um, so that's you know, kind of the, the gist of what we do here at the museum. So thinking about the things that you might have, and you know, for you, you know, what might have value historically? What is worth preserving? Well, it's different for everybody. Um, what I like to say about uh, the materials in our museum is you could probably pick all of the objects in our museum on display, except for maybe a handful, are really not worth anything. If you went on eBay and tried to sell them, you might get like $2 for it, right? It's an old t-shirt, or it's an old shoe, or it's someone's old luggage. So it's not, it doesn't really have any monetary value. But the historical value is quite significant. We use those objects to tell stories about the people who used them, the families that owned them. And then we use all of those stories of those objects to talk about our community and what it means to be Arab American past and present. Um, you know, what I would think is valuable are things that tell unique stories. So keeping old magazines like National Geographic's, they might be special to you, but they wouldn't help tell the story of who you are, right? Because you're not in the magazine. You didn't write the magazine or produce the magazine. And so sometimes people will come to us with boxes of old magazines and say, these must be important because they're old. And we'll say, well, they might be important to you, but they're not the kinds of things we would put in our collection because they don't tell us anything unique about you, your family, or our community. So um, you know, just because something is older uh, doesn't mean that it's, it's gained historical value. So the goal of what I would like to do this evening is just show very basic things you can do with a hypothetical situation that you come across a cardboard box of stuff in yours or a family member's basement, attic, or garage. And just some of the easy things you can do to start to preserve that material so that it sticks around a little bit longer. Uh, paper that has been made in the last 100 years is actually made of very cheap materials. And um, I, I saw this really uh, sad, alarming report that <laughs> apparently paper produced after like 1890 will, no matter how well you preserve it, will eventually just completely disintegrate to dust because it's not made of the same quality material that paper was made from earlier. This is why we have manuscripts and things that are hundreds of years old because the paper was usually like linen or animal skin or something. So they're saying like, you know, it's going to be really hard to preserve the paper we have today for hundreds of years. Um, so we're going to try our best. We're going to do what we can do now to, to help that along. Um, 
So you come across a cardboard box, and this would be a very nice cardboard box to find it in. This is uh, what's called a banker's box, and the majority of our collected, collected materials are in boxes like this. They're easy to find anywhere, any sort of uh, office supply store will have these. They're already kind of archival quality, um, even the cheaper ones, just from the way that they're made to store files. And if you find it in a box like this, all right, you're already like ahead of the game. Um, it's, it's in a nice, uh, sturdy, safe box. If it's in a basement, that, and if it's in a Dearborn basement, um, maybe get it out of that basement, because it might flood at some point in the next few months, unfortunately, um, the way things are going. So if, if the box is in a basement, try to get it up a little bit higher. If it's in a garage, try to make sure it's away from pests, you know, bugs, things that eat paper, mice, rodents. If it's in an attic, if it's an attic that gets really, really hot in the summer, be aware if, the, like, if certain kinds of photographs are in there. If they're in like a plastic sleeve, have you ever gone, gotten something down from the attic that was in a plastic sleeve and then all of a sudden the paper or the photograph in the sleeve are now one because they've sort of melted together? So keep an eye on temperature is really big. Temperature and moisture are the, the biggest things you can do to preserve something first. Um, cardboard is fine. If you want to put it in a plastic tote, that usually works. Some materials will actually do worse in a plastic tote because they need that sort of airflow. Sometimes keeping things really sealed in actually makes it worse in the long run. But your best bet is a, a really nice cardboard box. Um, second is be aware of using like tape. Uh, you know, scotch tape is easy and quick, but it really does not do well on paper products because you can't take it off without ripping things. Um, so tape is never usually a good idea. Uh, metal staples and metal paper clips will likely eventually rust um, and, and, and damage the pieces that they're on. So paper, paper clips are fine, or no paper clips. And I'm going to show you some ways to store things that you probably don't need paper clips or wouldn't use them. Um, and then if you have, like, especially photographs, slides, video cassettes, these prefer cooler storage. I don't think most of you have a dedicated AV fridge, right? But if you did, <laughs> that's really great, but um, we're not expecting that. Um, so the easiest kinds of supplies to have to use are the things I'm going to demonstrate here, which are acid-free folders. So most of the file folders you buy at Staples or Office Supply Store, they, they would be fine, but archival quality acid-free folders aren't much more expensive, and you can be assured that the papers and the photographs that you put in them won't in five to 10 years start to turn brown or start to have chemical interactions with the paper, um, which is always uh, sad to see. Oh, it's good to have acid-free folders. It's good to have acid-free paper. So archival quality acid-free paper is your best friend when you're trying to preserve photographs and documents. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of different ways to do that. You also, you can have um, different kinds of photographic sleeves, different kinds of mylar or polyurethane. And uh, I'll talk about it a little bit with photographs, um, but you really don't need to put photographs in here unless they're photographs that you think people are going to be touching and handling. But if you're just putting photographs away to be kept for a long time and maybe you don't expect people to, to handle them all the time, you don't need photographic sleeves. You can just use an archival folder with paper. And then another great tool is using a pencil or something like a micron pen. And so uh, a micron pen is great because you can, um, you can write and write really nice things without having to press almost at all. So you can write on the backs of photos and unlike with a pencil or like a ballpoint pen and you have to press really hard and then you turn the photo around and you can see where you wrote because it kind of pushed through, a micron pen uh, will not do that. You can see I'm barely, you know, barely touching the paper and it will write fine. Also what's great is it's archival quality ink which means it won't fade, and it will likely not interact negatively with any of the things you're writing on. So, so that's really all you need. Oh, and a box, so a cardboard box. A banker's box, or these are much fancier. These are called document boxes. They're about $12 a piece, but they're really nice if you don't like the bigger boxes and you want to have um, you know, something easier. You, know, you throw these on the shelf. You can put a bunch of these on a shelf together. You can certainly put uh, one photo in a folder, which is the case for, so this is right from our collection. So what we do with our folders is 
Um, you know, you write across the top so you know what it is. So as you're going through the box, you can quickly just see what is in there. And then in this one, we actually have a photograph. This is of uh, the Dix Mosque uh, being constructed in the south end of Dearborn. Um, it's not in the best shape as a photo. <laughs> there are better co copies of it. I think uh, Dearborn Historical has a better copy. But in this photo, we just have the one photograph. Or another way to do it is you can, if you're short on folders, you can actually put a lot of photographs in a folder and you just interleaf them with the acid-free paper. So in this sense, this is, this is the easiest way to do it. Um, you don't need to worry about photo albums or scrapbooks. Um, again, if, you're, if, if these are photos that you want to share with people all the time, you'll want to put them in some sort of you know, mylar sleeve or polyester sleeve because people are going to be handling them. But if you're just really trying to make an archive and preserve them, you can put a bunch of photos together as long as they're not touching each other and separated with the paper, um, you're good to go. They won't interact with each other. It will really keep the process of, um, of deterioration of the photograph and the inks. It will slow it down tremendously as opposed to just having a bunch of photos in a box all laying on top of each other and touching each other. Some of the most important things you can do is once you have all this stuff put together, um, is to sit down with people in your family who know about the collection and record metadata. The metadata is super important. So the metadata are things like who's in the photo, where was the photo taken, um, you know, what year was it, if you can remember, and try to either write it on the back of the photo or if you have it in a folder, you know, write the information across the top of the folder. Because what happens is people will donate wonderful photos to us. I mean, just the most amazing photos. We won't know who's in them, what year it's from, where it was taken. And so we can still kind of use the photos sometimes as like background, but we can't tell the whole story with them. So metadata is crucial to making sure that you're capturing your family's real story. Because, you know, once the people that know who's in that photo are gone, you're probably not going to find out who's in that photo. It's very difficult. Um, and so as far as adding metadata to your family story, I think the best way to do that is to, uh, to do oral histories or uh, record oral narratives from people. And to tell that story, I'm going to ask uh, Sheva and George. You can both come up. We've got two mics. Hi, I'm Sheva Najim. I'm a community historian here at the museum. I'm George. Uh, I'm also a community historian here at the museum. Yeah, so we do oral history collections um, for most of our jobs. Um, so. We can talk about like easy practices of doing oral history, which is basically just, okay, so you want to start with a person, um, make sure they're okay with their video being recorded, you know, have, we do consent forms here, but you're free to just, you know, verbal consent. Um, you can use your phone, uh, there's a recorder on there, uh, it's easy, it's on the go. Or if you have a laptop, you can record them on there. Uh, just be careful of the background uh, of the recording, like noise or, you know, flashing lights or anything like that. Have a clean look and, uh, I, don't know. I don't know, it's kind of hard to put it together. Um, just make sure to ask um, the questions you want to ask, like prepare before. That's what I usually do, like based on the person, I like make a list of questions that I want to talk about and then go from there. So um, just keep it under two hours, uh, record it, um, be natural. I like to do casual interviews. Uh, it doesn't have to be too structured. Just make sure you're saving it in like multiple places. Like if it's just on, a, if it's on your laptop, save it there, but also put it on a hard drive or like it burn on a CD or something. Consent is one of the biggest things, like never ever record somebody's stories without their consent. It can be a lot of legal trouble. And then when you do record their oral histories, like make sure that they know that. A lot of people are very hesitant to record their oral histories because they think they're not important. They've never done anything important in their lives, but you never know. I mean, you could be asking them questions and then they might have unlocked a memory that they haven't thought about in years. And it's, it's so important. Everybody has a story. Everybody came from somewhere. Like how they came here, why they came here. You know, what, was, what were they growing up like? What was their travel coming to the States like? Or even if this is not in the United States. But yeah, just like Shada said, like it doesn't have to be formal. So like a lot of people also feel intimidated when you pull out a camera. And then you don't have to like question them like a drill sergeant. Um, very conversational, like have a list of questions that are prepared ahead of time. And then you might not even ask those questions because you're just asking questions yeah. based on the conversation that you're having. And those are the best oral histories that you could possibly get.
Yeah. It can be multiple sessions too. So, and also I was going to talk about the kind of questions we ask. Uh, so I usually like to start from the beginning, beginning, like uh, where were they born? Like where did they grow up? Uh, that talk about the environment they grew up in. You know, they can talk about their family, like their, who are their grandparents? Like what memories do they have with them? Who are their parents, siblings? Like what stuff like from childhood and move along um, like to middle school, like high school. Uh, inspirations during that time, like experiences, and then go into career. And so there's like some structure there. Um, that's how I usually like to do it. And end with the current moment. Like um, I usually like to ask about feelings a lot. Like what are you feeling in this moment? You know, uh, what are some reflections uh, that you want to share with us and stuff like that. So, but of course you don't have to follow that. If they want to talk about one specific thing, let them talk. People usually talk about what they're mostly interested in, which is like the good stories. So, oh, and if you do want to edit, uh, I just use like Mac iMovie editing. It's really easy. Yeah. Cool. yeah. For me, one of the best ways, one of the most um, convenient ways, is you can actually put it on your iTunes, um, so it can come up as like a song in your playlist. But it'll just be. I mean, you don't have yeah. to listen to it every day as a song. But also, if you have iPhone. <laughs> yeah, also, if you have iPhone. It'll come up as like an MP3 file. So that's probably one of the easiest, most accessible ways that you're going to have it. You can transfer an MP3 file anywhere. It can be on a CD, it can be on your phone, it can be on a USB laptop, anywhere. So it's really like it's up to the person where they feel most comfortable keeping it and who they want to keep it with or where they want to store it, for example. Yeah, and then uh, another thing that we do um, as oral historians, um, when we do oral histories, and they're usually like um, audio-only files, um, we'll ask the person that we're interviewing to you know, bring a couple maybe old family photos that they have, maybe like a birth certificate, maybe whether they immigrated, maybe like an immigration um, card that they had, um, just to see, um, just so whoever is watching or whoever is listening can see that, oh, this context, was, yeah. yeah, the context of what their story is and what it was like. Like, family photos are so precious, but, like, you don't always know who's in the photo or what the context of the photo was. And one of the best ways to learn about that photo is to have the voice of who was in that photo. What were they feeling in that moment? What was happening in that moment? And then a photo is a lot more than a face value. It was, it was a moment in, that's literally captured in time forever until that photo disappears. But that photo doesn't have to disappear if you have the person's voice.